So I'm Glenn Middlehauser. I'm the director of Maine Natural History Observatory. Um, I've done a lot of work on the on the coast of Maine over the years, working on plants and birds, um, setting down baseline data sets for a lot of things. And I'm excited to have Elliot Johnson join our team. He's um, a postdoctoral research associate with Maine Natural History Observatory. And he's jumping in to start up a few coastal island monitoring projects. And he's going to fill us in on what he's he's got proposed and uh, stuff he's going to be working on. So there's been some people joining since I last mentioned this, but if everyone can stay muted and if you have questions, put them in the chat and we'll um, you can type in your questions at any point. But we'll save them up for the end of Elliot's talk and. Uh, We'll read the questions then. So with that, I'll introduce Elliot Johnston, our postdoc research associate with Maine Natural History Observatory. All right, thank you, Glenn. Uh, so you can hear me all right and see my screen, correct? Okay, just wanna make sure. Uh, get rid of this, I don't have to, okay. Um, all right, thanks everybody for joining us this evening. Um, as Glenn mentioned, Elliot Johnston, postdoctoral research associate at Maine Natural History Observatory. Okay, there we go. Um, so just a brief outline of the talk so you kind of know what's coming and uh, give you some uh, reference points for, for how long it'll be. I'm gonna give an overview of Maine Natural History Observatory. Um, throughout the talk, I'll just refer to it as MNHO, um, a little bit quicker. Um, I'll introduce myself. Um, I'll give a little bit of background on some of my um, research at UMaine, so you kind of know where I'm coming from. And then I'll talk through some current proposed projects um, at MNHO. What is it doing? Um, so MNHO was founded by Glenn in 2003. Um, so it's celebrating um, 20 years this year. Uh, it's a nonprofit um, whose mission is to improve the understanding of natural resources in Maine by compiling both historic information um, and then also contemporary um, inventory and monitoring efforts um, centered around Maine's natural history. I'm just going to have to click through this. Um, so MNHO has done uh, a lot of diverse things over 20 years. Um, I've grabbed some of these from the website, um, just some highlights, you know, include uh, purple sandpiper movement monitoring, uh, being a major partner in the Maine bird atlas, um, Maine night jar work that um, Logan at MNHO is doing as well, um, museum curation, owl work, uh, lots of field guides, um, and, the, and the list sort of goes on. Um, and so these have led to a lot of um, really great uh, publicly accessible resources. So um, one example here is uh, this Plants on Main Islands uh, sort of interactive web tool that you can, it's, it's not an active link, but uh, you can go to the website down there. Um, and it combines both historical data and contemporary surveys on over 270 main islands. And this is just a static screenshot, but you can, on the website, um, use the pull down to select for different species. So here I've just done an example for Carolina sea lavender, and you can see, um, you know, it's found all the way down south in Kittery on one island, um, all the way up to Copscook Bay. Um, MNHO has produced um, a number of field guides, um, starting in 2010 with plants of Acadia National Park. Um, the most recent one, Wildflowers of Maine Islands in 2021, um, and the field guide to Maine seaweeds is currently in development. Um, another big project that just wrapped up recently was the second Maine Bird Atlas. Uh, the first one was compiled in the late 70s and early 80s, and MNHO uh, was a major partner on that and um, a huge undertaking throughout the entire state. And you can see this screen grab here. Um, showing the you know point count locations of of surveys over those four years throughout the entire state. Um, so for those not familiar with the organization, um, you probably 
can tell by now that it's uh, main focused um, and it's, it's really member driven as well. So all projects are funded by memberships, um, grants and donations, and it's a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, all right, so I'm going to transition to sort of just introducing myself. Um, so postdoc here um, uh, for sort of part of the time and also an avian ecologist at Petrotech uh, the other half of the time. Um, my background is really as a field ecologist, um, mostly focused on avian conservation projects. Um, just graduated from the University of Maine, uh, earned my PhD in ecology and environmental science uh, in May of this year. And um, here I'm pictured with my advisors, uh, Amanda Klemmer and Brian Olson. And my dissertation research really focused on um, the interactions between members of aquatic food webs. And um, I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the projects, but that's sort of the um, unifying theme across a couple of different projects during the past um, five or six years. So before I dive into some of my research background um, and projects coming up here, uh, as Glenn mentioned, MNHO does a lot of coastal research. Um, that's also sort of been my focus um, you know, previously and going forward. So I thought it would be helpful to spend some time sort of uh, saying you know, why it's important to focus research efforts on the coast of Maine. So environmental change is really accelerating uh, quite dramatically along the coast. And you know, this is a, a, an important time to, as Glenn mentioned earlier, collect baseline data as things continue to change. And so this is from Gulf of Maine Research Institute. And you can see that the um, uh, sea surface temperatures in the Gulf of Maine are you know, accelerating and warming quite quickly in recent years. Um, and then this is from the Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine. Um, the, the thing on the left is showing the entire state, but the um, plot on the right is specific to the coastal zone. Uh, you can see it's demarcated by that black line. And so, you know, relative to the 20th century or sorry, 21st century average, um, it, uh, no, it is the 20th century. Sorry, I'm getting all mixed up here. Um, you can see temperatures uh, recently have, you know, really spiked in that coastal zone. So, you know, thinking about intertidal zones that are exposed to water part of the time and underwater. And then for the other part of the time at low tide are exposed to air temperatures. They're sort of stressors on all fronts. Um, we're also seeing changes in food webs. Um, many of you are probably familiar with green crabs, um, European green crabs, they're native to Europe and they've spread really throughout the world, um, uh, you know, having been introduced um, probably through ships and, and, and trade um, and so they've moved their way up the East Coast and are um, quite prevalent in Maine. Um, and so, you know, climate change is often talked about sort of projecting um, what things might look like in, you know, say 2080. And, and um, it's important to have those projections, but, you know, we're also seeing contemporary observed impacts right now. Um, and so this is from Petratus and Junjun uh, paper in 2020 showing pretty steep declines in blue, Russell, blue mussel recruitment in the Gulf of Maine. Um, you know, some of you may have noticed just anecdotally seeing a lot fewer blue mussel around. Um, and then this is from Beale et al. 2018, um, sort of highlighting the um, interaction between green crab and soft shell clams. And so, you know, you can see that negative relationship where when you have higher biomass of green crabs, you have much lower recruitment of uh, soft shell clams, presumably, you know, the green crab are eating the um, young recruits. Um, we're also seeing uh, species that have typically been associated with the mid-Atlantic and haven't quite made it around Cape Cod, uh, becoming more common in Maine waters. Um, examples are, you know, the blue crab and the black sea bass. Um, and then also, you know, like I was saying earlier, there are you know, quite a number of projections out there. Um, this is from a second century stewardship project um, that was funded by the Skudik Institute. Um, and so you can see uh, the, these uh, maps of Maine showing the probability of occupancy. Um, in other words, you know, are they gonna occur in a given location under um, different climate um, emissions scenarios? And so you can see particularly under that RCP 8.5 um, high emission scenario by 2080, um, you know, magnolia warbler are going to have higher probabilities of occupancy in Maine and in more northern locations uh, at higher elevations. 
And that's a little hard to see, but also sort of in down east coastal zones, um, which will sort of inform some of the research I'm going to talk about later. And so, you know, that that area, which is relatively cool, you know, a lot of fog banks may act as sort of a climate change refugia for some species that, um, you know, it's it's not quite suitable habitat anymore in other parts of Maine. So, um, you know, hopefully it sort of outlines some of the, 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 the priorities for research along the coast of Maine. Um, and I'm going to start with um, some of my research during my doctorate at UMaine, and then I'll talk about some projects at MNHO. But, you know, all of the work is really driven by um, identified priorities. You know, obviously people want to study things that um, seem important and timely and, and people want to know uh, the results of. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about is the effects of rockweed harvest on the intertidal bird community in Maine. So um, many of you are probably familiar with rockweed if you've spent any time along um, rocky intertidal zones in Maine, um, which there are a lot of. Uh, you can see the, the distribution here along both western and eastern coastlines of the North Atlantic. Um, and so rockweed is um, photosynthetic, um, and so it forms the base of a rocky intertidal food web. Um, being a intertidal species during high tide, um, it has air bladders where it can sort of float up to the top of the water and create this structural heterogeneity in the water column, which you know provides foraging habitat for birds um, and then places to sort of hide from predators for um, species lower in the food web. And then when the tide goes out and it's low tide, you know, rockweed drapes over the rocky substrate and um, sort of creates refuge from intense abiotic conditions for um, macroinvertebrates, especially those that are sessile and can't move. You know, if you're a barnacle or a blue mussel, um, you didn't have rockweed, you know, you, you couldn't really move to a, a cooler place potentially. Um, and so it's sort of going back to that identified research need. Um, when the grant for this research was written, um, I think it was probably in 2017. I started as a grad student in 2018. Um, this is the total landings for rockweed in the state of Maine. Um, the gray bars are the uh, live pounds, and then the uh, black triangles are the value. So you, know, you can see since 2001, the total amount harvested was, was pretty steadily increasing. And um, you know, there definitely needs to be some research um, in this system. So we had a, um, a number of graduate students on this project looking at different parts of the food web. Um, and so uh, sort of my role in this was you know, looking at how commercial rockweed harvesting um, impacts um, that upper trophic level of birds. And so birds do not directly feed on rockweed, but they, you know, feed on uh, macroinvertebrates, uh, you know, amphipods or, you know, small crabs, things like that, epiphytes um, that depend themselves on the rockweed habitat. Um, rockweed's harvested um, by cutter rake and um, also by uh, mechanical uh, sort of additions to boats, and then also at low tide by knife harvest. Um, and so we set up this commercial rockweed harvest experiment with a number of, of companies in Maine, um, with sites ranging from about Harpswell to uh, Eastport. And you can see in panel C, uh, this is from the Penobscot region, sort of a, a control impact type study design. And then panel D, an example of a site. Um, it's a 100 meter stretch of shoreline uh, between high and low tide. So here are some of the pictures of harvest. Um, you know, the top one is obviously a, a, a mechanical boat. It's got sort of like a suction cutter on that front arm. And then the bottom one is uh, rake harvest where, you know, they throw out the rake and uh, fill the boat. So um, this is an example of just uh, hypothetical dummy data. I'll show the, the, the our actual results on the next slide, but just to kind of orient you to what it'll look like on the um, Y axis, we'll have bird count. And then on the X, we'll have discrete time period. So before harvest, immediately after harvest, and then a year after to sort of quantify that um, one year post harvest recovery, and then different symbols for control and impact. There I am doing some point counts. Um, so these graphs are a little dense. I'll kind of um, explain them. Um, so we've broken up the response to sort of our full intertidal bird community. Um, our low tide community and our high tide. And so 
Um, on the y-axis, on, on the left y, we have model predicted counts. Um, and those are represented by those um, solid dark symbols, um, the circle being control, the triangle being impact. Um, and then I've also plotted the raw data, um, which corresponds to this right y. Um, and this in the size of the circle, it represents how many um, observations of that value we had. So you can see we had a lot of zero counts. Um, and then finally, there's an asterisk up here for the interval where um, things are statistically supported. So um, you can see that rockweed harvest had a residual, small residual positive impact on bird communities. Um, and then for the low tide community, um, there was a negative impact of harvest um, relative to control sites. Um, and then residual positive effect once again um, after harvest. And we didn't see any supportive relationship for the high tide community. Um, once again, these are a little dense. Kind of the main takeaway that I'd like to sort of just highlight is that, you know, if you look at the model predicted counts, um, these changes are really on the order of, you know, 0.5 birds, one bird. And so both negative and positive effects of harvest um, were quite small. Um, and really one of the biggest, I think, outcomes of the study were the really high zero counts we had at our site. So you can see this histogram here of different survey counts we had, the number of birds we saw. You can see by far uh, most of them, um, or many of them were zero counts. So sort of zooming out a little bit to kind of put this in context, um, you know, main intertidal zones are pretty diverse. There's lots of different intertidal habitat types. Um, in southern Maine, we have a lot of sandy beaches. Um, there's tidal salt marsh, uh, extensive mud flats, particularly down east, and then sort of rocky intertidal where we see um, rockweed often. And so in some of these intertidal zones, we have um, what we call obligate habitat specialists that um, you know, predictably use that habitat type to breed or complete their life cycle in some way. And so for beaches, you know, piping plovers, you're not going to find them in salt marshes. They're always going to be on beaches nesting. Um, same with least terns. Um, in salt marshes, Nelson and tidal salt marsh sparrow. And then, you know, mud flats are really important um, stopover sites for migratory shorebirds. Um, but we don't really see um, obligate habitat specialists in rocky intertidal zones outside of purple sandpaper, which um, you know occur in Maine in the winter and are sort of uh, separate from this study. And so birds sort of use the rocky intertidal opportunistically, um, either at low tide or high tide. And so um, you know it's not quite clear if our high zero counts were a result of our study design. Um, our sites were sort of small relative to total home range size or if the zero counts really are, are sort of biologically meaningful. And so, you know, I think there needs to be some further study on understanding what um, rockweed and um, rocky intertidal zones represent um, within sort of the total resource needs of coastal birds. So, you know, if you imagine this is all hypothetical, but these um, blue overlays are home ranges, you know, a crow might come into the intertidal during low tide, um, but it's also going to forage in the upland or a common eider um, might come into the intertidal at high tide, but it's also going to spend a lot of time in the subtidal. Um, so some sort of tracking study, I think, would be at a really fine spatial scale, um, an important next step here. Um, and then finally, um, you know, population sizes of um, birds have many stressors. Um, just some examples, you know, um, avian predation on chicks, or mammalian predation on eggs, um, a warming gulf of Maine, um, you know, eiders, or there's a season for hunting on them, um, aquaculture, rockweed harvest. And so our results don't suggest that rockweed harvest is this major limiting factor. Um, and so, you know, we don't exactly know how it fits into uh, relative to other limiting factors, but um, it's just something to, to think about in, in terms of the next steps. All right, so now I'm going to talk about um, purple sandpipers, and this is going to start to tie in some of the MNHO work, um, both previous work and um, upcoming work. Um, so for those not familiar, purple sandpiper are a shorebird. Um, they have a circumpolar breeding distribution. Uh, you can see there in the light orange. Um, and they're relatively unique among shorebirds in that they, they overwinter at really high northern latitudes. Uh, where many shorebirds make, you know, long distance migrations and either 
um, you know, go down to South America or at least sort of the Southeast U.S. Um, or, or other zones. And so um, in terms of just, you know, the U.S. jurisdiction, Maine supports a pretty high density of wintering individuals in the U.S. Um, and so there's, you know, really a high responsibility in the state on the part of um, wildlife managers in, in managing this West Atlantic um, population. Um, so Glenn and colleagues conducted coastwide surveys um, from 2002 to 2007 to um, really establish some baseline data and get a sense of how many purple sandpipers were in Maine. Um, also compiled or also um, had some um, historical data in there as well. Um, and they estimated that 14 to 17,000 purple sandpipers wintered annually in Maine um, across those years. Um, they then went on to repeat some surveys in a subset of the coast, both in the mid coast and the down east zones. You can see an example um, survey route here um, from 2013 to 17. And they noted a 49% decline in purple sandpiper winter counts since that 2002 to 2007 um, baseline period. Um, and so, you know, in thinking about uh, you know, warming Gulf of Maine and climate change, one of the typical organism responses is, you know, moving north. Um, we saw that with the, the, the blue crab and the black sea bass and the green crab. And so trying to understand, you know, do these represent flyway level declines or, you know, is there sort of a redistribution of purple sandpipers? Um, if there are flyway level declines, you know, trying to understand when and where is the population limited um, the strongest. Um, you know, obviously there's breeding, breeding ground limitations, um, limitations during the migratory period. But um, for one of my dissertation projects, I chose to focus on uh, winter diet. And, you know, the, the overwintering period is relatively long um, from, you know, November to April um, compared to a, a relatively short breeding season. Um, also overwintering in Maine as a, as a small bird, um, you know, you can imagine the, the thermoregulatory challenges, um, potentially if, if you're, you know, not getting an adequate diet. Um, and so that was sort of the idea behind, um, this project. Um, in addition, I've already showed the figure on the left, but some other figures from the same paper, um, seeing some declines in macroinvertebrates that have historically been quite common in purple sandpiper diet. So, you know, in thinking about um, those declines that, that that Glenn and others noted, you know, uh, there was a hypothesis that, you know, diet could maybe play a role. Um, and so we conducted um, uh, a metabarcoding study, which I'll explain in a second, um, uh, looking at um, winter diet in the Sorrento and South Addison regions um, during uh, 2018 and 2019. And uh, here's a photo. Um, Glenn's one of the, the people on the boat, along with Donna, and they've just dropped me off on a ledge. And it's hard to see, but there are purple sandpipers right there. Um, they're pretty tame um, to, to humans coming on the, the um, ledge, which is um, kind of wild. But anyway, so we um, collected fecal samples. And the idea here is we were using molecular techniques to get at what they were eating. So um, many diet studies historically, um, before this technique was widespread, had to either take the birds and, you know, open them up and look what was in their stomach and sort of morphologically examine that or sort of pick apart through the feces. And so by using this DNA approach, um, you know, you're just picking up their fecal samples. So there's a, a lower risk to sample birds. Um, you have a lot larger sample size, you know, you can just go and pick up as much poop as you want. Um, and then by using, uh, you know, DNA tools, you have a pretty high resolution description of diet. Um, one of the limitations of, of, of previous diet analyses was, you know, if they were eating things that were soft bodied, like an amphipod, that would break down pretty quickly and wouldn't be um, left over like a, you know, fragment of a blue mussel shell would be. Um, but this technique doesn't come without its own limitations. Um, you can't quantify absolute prey biomass. Um, it's just sort of presence, absence, or relative abundance. Um, you also can't figure out differences within a species. Um, you know, your results are just going to tell you that you had, uh, say, blue muscle. It's not going to tell you, you know, whether it was really small or really large. Um, and then that sensitivity, which is an asset, can also be a limitation. 
Um, you know, you could pick up environmental contamination um, in, in the field or in the lab. Um, so to sort of address some of that contamination, we had positive and negative field controls um, where we built this collection box on the left for our positive controls where we captured um, a few purple sandpipers, um, put them in these cells and they defecated onto the tin foil below. Um, and then, so we had these samples that were really clean and not, you know, sitting on seaweed or rocks. And, um, and then we had a few negative controls where we just took some seawater and then scraped the rock to see if we were, you know, potentially picking up anything that um, could skew our results. Um, so I'll sort of orient you to this. This is the, the, the main, one of the main result um, graphs. And so each vertical bar represents a single fecal sample and they're sort of divided by you can see location and date um, up on the top there. And the different colors just represent the different um, categories. Um, and so you can see, uh, I should say also the, um, if there's like four different colors in a bar, it meant there were, you know, those four things. It's sort of just percent of occurrence. Um, so the main takeaway here is that uh, there's a lot of blue. And so purple sandpipers were eating a lot of barnacles. Um, which they've been known to do based on the literature, but it certainly was a, a, a novel result that it was a, a primary diet item. It had never been described as, as you know, the thing most favored by purple sandpipers. Um, you might be wondering, you know, barnacles are awfully common. Is this an instance of environmental contamination? Um, but we still, our, our positive control supported that. We had barnacles in two out of the three fecal samples that you know, came directly from the birds. And then we didn't have any barnacle signals in our um, negative field controls. Um, so in thinking about our results, um, you know, why are purple sandpapers eating predominantly barnacles? Um, one interpretation is that, you know, they always have been, um, but they've been able to, you know, with adult barnacles sort of chip in through the top and eat that fleshy main body where presumably a lot of the, the calories are. And in morphological examinations of diet, that would have broken down really quickly. And only when they had gotten, you know, part of the, the shell would it have showed up. Um, sort of a, another option is that, uh, so barnacles are, you know, free swimming when they're larvae, and then they settle on rocks when they're really small, and then they get bigger. And so, if they're feeding on really small barnacles, um, and they always have been, you know, that also may not have shown up in uh, when you're picking through stomach contents and, and looking for um, signs of what they were eating. But there also potentially is support for our original idea. You know, if there were steep declines in blue muscle, which were previously really common, they may, you know, be picking up that slack with barnacles, um, which are, uh, you know, a pretty common diet item. Um, and there is some interesting research out of Europe showing that um, wintering oyster catchers are also sort of dealing with near collapse of, so in the title it says their prey, which um, is, is blue mussel. And so, you know, there could be some um, similar things happening on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, but more research needs to be done to, you know, understand if any of this is sort of interacting or causing population declines. Um, Here's a fun little video, um, purple sandpaper foraging at low tide in the Congress and Mastocarpus low inner tidal. Maybe eating a lot of barnacles, I don't know. Um, and so this is sort of just a silly slide, but you know, in both of these research projects, there's no sort of like tidy, like this is exactly what this means and we can tie a bow on it and we can move on to the next thing. And so you know, I just want to point out that you know, science a project is like laying a brick on a wall where, you know, it's resting on all of the previous work that's been done and there's more work that's going to go on top. But, you know, in both cases, uh, there certainly are some questions coming out of the research and it's not like, you know, we know everything now. So just to kind of keep in mind. Um, so I'm going to shift to um, with that sort of background on sort of where I'm coming from in coastal research. Um, talking about some of the postdoc projects at MNHO. And I'll start with, um, uh, the first one will be relatively brief, um, with the purple sandpaper work, since we were just talking about that. And then um, we'll have some more time to talk about um, the land bird breeding project. Just going to take a sip of water.
Um, so every 10 years, um, Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife produces a wildlife action plan, which sort of, you know, gives the state of wildlife in, in Maine, um, you know, which species are threatened, um, which are, you know, what are the primary um, lim limiting factors. And so in the 2005 to 2015 plan, purple sandpipers down there at the bottom in the, in the red box, we're listed as um, SGCN is species of greatest conservation need. Um, and then the 2015 to 2025 plan, which we're getting to the end of that plan, they were listed as they were upgraded to a priority one um, SGCN species. And so, you know, in thinking about, we're about to have another um, plan developed that's gonna you know last for 10 years. Um, there haven't been purple sandpaper surveys since um, 2017. And so, you know, I think there's a high need to um, get a sense of if those declines observed in that, um, you know, 2012 to 2017 period have continued, if if the purple sandpipers have sort of stabilized, or if their populations have have recovered. And so um, this coming winter, we're going to repeat some um, historical survey routes in the Penobscot and Frenchman Bay region, um, and sort of populating this overlay here. That was the, you can kind of see it matches up. This was the um, previous figure that I showed, but you know, this is one example of a, a survey route launching out of Stonington, kind of around Ilaho over towards Vinyl Haven and, you know, back around. And so by repeating the survey route, we'll have, you know, and, and Glenn will be out there and he was out there previously and make sure that the, you know, methods are kind of one-to-one -one so we can directly compare these data to, to previous data and, you know, get a sense of how purple sandpipers are doing and um, the state shorebird biologist for IFNW has said he's you know interested or not interested but you know it, they may it, it may be warranted to to upgrade them to to state threatened if you know these steep declines have continued and obviously doing this before the creation of the the, the next state wildlife action plan um, is is quite important. Um, all right, and so the next project I'll be working on is um, assessing. Um, breeding land bird populations on coastal islands. So to sort of set the scene here, um, this is from a Rosenberg et al. 2019 paper in Science. Um, and so many land bird species in the U.S. have declined over the past half century. And so from tw uh, 1970 to 2017, um, you can see we've gained in some bird families. Um, Generally, waterfowl are doing pretty well. You know, there's certainly lots of turkeys um, and, and things like that, but those are far outweighed by um, pretty heavy losses in some bird groups, particularly um, American sparrows and wood warblers. So um, one way to sort of assess breeding birds at a, at a fine spatial scale um, within states are breeding bird atlases. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'll talk about the one that was recently completed, but um, yeah, these have been a great asset in many states and, you know, many states are on their, um, you know, second or third iteration or maybe even more, but I just had a really great time going through, um, some of the historical images of early breeding bird atlases. I mean, the, the art on them is, is really beautiful. And so, you know, I think that's kind of cool. So Maine did its first breeding bird atlas from 1978 to 1983. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the most recent one from 2018 to 2022 was most uh, was recently completed. Um, M MNHO is a big partner on that, and you can see here the um, you know gridded cells where where all that work took place. Um, but there you know are, there are some data gaps that remain. Um, one of those is you know certainly there are thousands of small forested islands on the coast of Maine, and it's you know totally not feasible to to survey them all. Um, and some of the, you know, the work uh, documenting breeding birds on coastal islands has historically focused on um, breeding seabird and coastal wading bird colonies, which are typically on, uh, you know, islands with open habitat types. Um, so you might still, you know, not be convinced why studying breeding land birds on small forested islands, you know, is really worthwhile. Um, they're, you know, they're small after all, but you know, I think there is a rare opportunity to temporally align, um, you know, which birds are breeding on islands with breeding bird atlas data. Um, 
obviously breeding bird atlases don't happen, uh, you know, all that often. It's, you know, a, a few decades at least before the next one. And so, you know, if I want to do this project in 15 years, you know, whatever I find would be hard to compare one-to-one -one with breeding bird atlas data because, you know, environmental conditions um, will have changed since then. And so um, there are also, like I said, there's a ton of small forested islands out there. So it's a relatively common habitat type. This isn't some, you know, obscure habitat type, um, and they're certainly understudied. Um, as I showed earlier with that um, uh, projected map of uh, Magnolia Warbler, um, islands could act as climate change refugia. Um, you know, coastal zones are often moderated by the ocean and are cooler than inland habitats. And so, um, as Glenn said in his intro, you know, MNHO is really focused on compiling baseline data, both to see, you know, who is there currently that may not be there in 30 years and, um, you know, who's not there that might move um, up from the south in coming decades. Um, and then also there, you know, there's anecdotal evidence of land bird declines in this habitat type. And so one example is black pole warbler. Um, so you can see here on the left, uh, a distribution map just showing its breeding and migratory range, the breeding in the red. And you can see that Maine is sort of at the, you know, southern end of that distribution. It's really a, a boreal breeder. And so um, in the birds of Maine book, uh, you know, they, they call out that they um, breed in stunted spruce forest habitat on coastal headlands and islands down east. Um, this is the range map from that page in, in the Birds of Maine. And um, you can see, you know, higher elevations in sort of north, central, and western Maine, and then this narrow strip in down east Maine. And so um, in talking with Glenn, it sounds like, you know, he certainly hears less black pole on islands these days. And so, you know, they, they may be moving north or disappearing, and so that's important to compile that data. Um, so how are we going to do that? Um, so we're going to use autonomous recording units, or ARUs, um, which are placed on islands, um, and they'll record data, and they will pick up um, singing birds, which we'll sort of use as a you know, proxy for possible or probable um, incidents of, of, of breeding. And then um, a big undertaking will be analyzing those data. And so the, um, the, the songs will be sort of visualized as um, sonograms and then, you know, try to figure out um, uh, the, the sort of signal of particular bird songs and classify them based on that. So um, this is example data from um, uh, some work in the Sonoran Desert um, using ARUs, but you know, I think a really cool application of this, and, and hopefully we can have sort of a, a data product like this, is, you know, for different species, you can have over the course of two months, these kind of cool density plots where you have these peaks and trough, troughs of activity. Um, I don't think, you know, based on a, a single, um, uh, how long the batteries last, we'll be able to have them out there for the entire migratory and breeding periods. But you know, we'll do the best we can. And, you know, I think it'll be interesting to see both spatially and temporally how um, these birds change over time on, on the islands. So we've already been piloting this project. Um, here's a screenshot of um, two ARUs we put out for about five weeks and recently retrieved on an island down east. Um, and so haven't had a chance to look at that data, but kind of excited to see um, you know, what that looks like and, and, and what we picked up. Um, so, you know, there are thousands of islands out there. Uh, in any research, it's important to, you know, think about feasibility. And so I just kind of want to highlight our, what we're thinking for study design. Um, so we're thinking of dividing the coast into three different regions. Um, really south of Casco Bay, there aren't a ton of islands and, um, you know, it's kind of far for Glenn and I. So, um, we're probably not going to focus on that region as much. Um, and so region one would be sort of Cape Elizabeth to Owl's Head, Owl's Head to Scudic Point, and then Scudic Point to um, Cobscook Bay. And our goal for next summer um, is to have four islands in each region for a total of 12. Um, once again, you know, just start fe feasible. I think that'll, you know, be, be generate lots of data um, and we're planning to use wildlife acoustics um, song meter minis. 
Um, like I said, mid-May to mid-July, I think on one set of batteries, we could get potentially about two months. Um, you know, trying to go longer and needing to go out there to um, switch out batteries or switch out memory cards in addition to, you know, setting them up and, and taking them down would, you know, just add a lot of field time. Um, we're going to try to put, you know, one to three ARUs use per island. Um, if there's some different sort of micro habitats, you know, I think obviously, you know, we'll have different um, bird groups in forest interior versus forest edge versus, you know, in sort of like a scrubby field. Um, so we'll sort of see what funding's like, how many ARUs we have, how many islands we have. And then obviously, you know, we're not going to record all day. We want to keep the data set um, uh, a manageable size. And so birds are pretty vocally active just after sunrise. And then we're also going to uh, record before sunset for some of those um, crepuscular birds. So, uh, you know, what are some of the anticipated project outcomes of this work? Um, once again, uh, you know, we really want this work to inform um, what wildlife managers in the state are thinking about in terms of conservation priorities. Um, and then, you know, having some sort of interactive web tool, sort of similar to this plants on main islands um, tool that's on the website. Um, and then, you know, in addition to having sort of presence absence, having some, you know, you could click on an island and maybe see, you know, over time, um, the different, you know, some species might arrive early, some a little later, and uh, just, just get a sense of that. Um, we're also partnering with Maine Island Trail Association to, um, you know, reach out to coastal landowners and ask for, you know, we're going to need to um, gain permission. Um, the islands that we were um, previously piloting were um, Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge, but, you know, we anticipate to um, definitely use, you know, private islands and, and, and talk with the landowners. And um, I also just think it's a cool opportunity. You know, there's a lot of recreational boaters, um, you know, kayak, powerboat, sailboat in Maine, and sort of give people a way to, you know, think about the islands that they're recreating on in a different, in a different way. And, you know, obviously they're sharing those spaces with, with land birds. And um, I think it could be a sort of a cool science communication tool. Um, so with that, uh, yeah, it was about right on time. Um, Thank you. Uh, thanks for taking part of your evening to um, uh, come to the talk and, and hang out with us. And, um, you know, if this work is work you think is exciting and, you know, please check out the website. There's lots more that MNHO has done that um, I didn't have time to highlight tonight, but you know, please consider becoming a member if you're not already. Um, and here's my uh, personal email if you'd you know, like to reach out after. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, uh, Elliot. I can leave that up. Yeah. That that was really interesting. It's uh, I'm always excited thinking about uh, baseline data that we need on the coast. It's it's never going to run out. I think of uh, cool projects that we need to collect data on. Yeah. So if anyone has some questions, <clears throat> they can put them in the chat or. Uh, this may be a small enough group where you could unmute yourself and ask, but we'll give folks a little bit of time to think if they have any questions. Hey, if no one else has a question, I would love to jump in if you guys can hear me correctly. Yeah. 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 Okay, awesome. Um, first of all, this was really interesting. Thank you for presenting on it. Um, I currently work at the Scudic Institute. I'm managing some of the bioacoustics work in Acadia National Park right now. And I had a quick question about your plans for data analysis. So currently for our project, we plan on using some software like BirdNet to help us process data. And I was wondering if you guys had been thinking about using any tools like that to get through the, I'm sure, really large amount of data you'll inevitably collect with this project. <laughs> um... I haven't gotten there yet. I definitely um, would love to chat when we do get there. Sort of my early idea is to use Kaleidoscope Pro, which is a wildlife acoustics product, just because, you know, we'll be using their ARUs. And um, But I have heard BirdNet as well, and I'm not sure if Kaleidoscope Pro uses BirdNet under the hood or not. I don't not yet. Not yet. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we'll use BirdNet if, you know, you think that's, have you started analyzing the data with BirdNet? 
Yeah, I have. Okay. And yep. I mean, have you found it um, helpful and intuitive or, or maybe not? Yeah, it's helpful in its own way. It definitely still needs a lot of human oversight, but for projects like this where you're collecting so much data, it can help speed up things in some ways. If you yeah. use it correctly, it's kind of, <laughs> if you use it wrong, you're causing some damage. Um, but yeah, I, I was just wondering if you guys had been thinking about things like that. Yeah. yeah. Are you able to automate the the assessment of your recordings through BirdNet? Or, or I'm not sure. Playing? I think actually, yes, at this point you can um, automate some work with BirdNet. Uh, if you mm -hmm. just do some work on the back end, kind of catering it to your own project. Um, mm -hmm. There's also an easier interface where you don't have to do any of that catering, but yeah, you can. Um, well, yeah, thanks for your answer. I had one other really quick question which was how difficult was getting out there for the purple sandpipers um, in the winter? Because I can only imagine that was pretty complicated. <laughs> yeah, it definitely was. Uh, we were sort of on call. Um, and then, you know, when a, a weather window presented itself, checked in maybe 48 hours to 72 hours beforehand. And so there definitely is not, you know, cannot be super advanced planning, but um, you know, wore a lot of layers and, you know, you saw those orange like survival suits and, yes. you know, Glenn's done a lot more of this than I have. So you can probably speak to some of that, but uh, you definitely have to be flexible. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, there's something yeah. interesting. I've been working on, you know, these offshore winter surveys since, you know, the first one I did was in 19, December of 1988. And I've been there hasn't been a lot of competition for wanting to go offshore in winter. So <laughs> it was a yeah. niche that we needed a lot of baseline data on. So I've done mm -hmm. a lot of surveys over the years. Um, but one thing I'm noticing, I've been at it long enough, is, is back in the 80s and 90s, there were a lot more days where I could get a boat safely out on the water. So... Hmm. I'd go a week or two looking for a good day and, you know, there'd be too windy or whatever and not a great day to be out on the water. But usually within two weeks, you could find a day to get out in the water safely. This was back then. In yeah. these days, you know, in the last five years for the, the main bird atlas, we did a lot of winter bird surveys offshore. And I waited six weeks for a single day on the water wow. and, and that's more typical these days it's gotten a lot windier it's uh noticeably uh in my research lifetime on these habitats and so it's it's a more challenging habitat to work in than it used to be yeah that's really interesting thank you both for your answers So we actually have a couple of questions that have come in on the chat here. Um, we have one, is there is there a minimum distance from the mainland for each island? Um, there is not as of now. I mean, I think we do want there to be some minimum distance. You know, the idea maybe is it's not just like at low tide, you could walk over there, you know, really uh, sort of feels like an island that's separated, but um no, I think if we have enough islands, it would be interesting to, you know, vary that kind of vary island size across your islands, vary distance from the mainland a little bit. So, you know, you could potentially assess patterns, um, you know, maybe some species only like islands of a certain size, you know, not too small and, and some that are offshore or maybe it doesn't matter. So, um, but I think to start, we'll sort of just see which islands we get landowner permission for and, and sort of take it from there, but um, definitely something we're thinking about. Great. Okay, we got another question. Can any of us non-scientists help you with your data collection beyond submitting sightings to eBird? That is a good question. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I guess I don't know yet. I don't have a great answer. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, I, maybe there could be some opportunities for helping with ARU deployment. I don't know. I'd have to talk to Glenn about that. You know, if we sort of, um, but that comes with all sort of, you know, boating safety things. And I, I don't know. Um, I, I, yeah, no, I was, 
I was pondering the same thing. It's, you know, there's there's a tool, there's a crew of people who do get out to islands who are good birders. And it's like, oh, okay, how do we put them to use either data collection or helping us deploy and collect units? And I think we're still in the early enough stage on this project where that's something we need to ponder how best to do that. And that there may be some options for helping in that way. And we'll just have to see as this project evolves. We're hoping to get units out on islands starting next spring. So um, we've got a, a winter to do some planning. Yeah, and there's another note here that said, you know, contributing to research funding is always helpful. You know, I know I recognize a lot of names here. I know a lot of you folks are already members of MNHO. Thank you so much. It is a huge help. But um, yeah, things like that are very helpful. Let's see. Okay, here's another question. Are there other high elevation breeders besides black pole warbler who also breed on the coast? Wondering about possible use of connecting with mountain birdwatch data sets out of Vermont Center for Echo Studies. Okay. Um, so the first part, um, yeah, I assume, you know, many boreal um, breeders probably breed along the Down East Coast. I think I'd probably defer to Glenn on that, who's probably you know, been around there a little bit longer and has a better sense, at least, you know, right now of, of, of the breeding distribution down there. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Glenn. Yeah, it's, uh, there's, there's always been a connection with Alpine summits and islands on the down east coast. So there's, there's some plants that grow in both of those habitats. And there's some birds like the black pole warbler, and a few others that that kind of do both. And it's because the, believe it or not, the habitat can be similar. You think of a mountain summit, it's kind of windy, it's cooler on the hottest days, and um, it, it's challenging. It's challenging being up there 24 hours a day for a couple months. And the same thing can happen on the offshore islands especially on the down east coast. The reason is they're cooler, they're 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 more steeped in the cold water current that originates from as a labrador current and it's foggy and it's windy and it's the plants are stunted on a lot of these islands. Not all of them, some of them have forests, but others are are have quite stunted veg. And so there are some similarities. Um and so in the past, there's been uh, boreal chickadees, bicknell's thrush, black pole warblers um, on these down east islands, but there really hasn't been a study looking at them uh, on these small islands where they show up. You know, I've I've heard about the black pole warbler story for years, and it used to be on a lot of islands. And I've only found it on one island for the main bird atlas, the Down East Island. And I suspect they must be on more. And I just haven't, you know, you, it takes a lot of work to get onto a single island at sunrise to hear if there's any black pole warblers. So maybe it's, we just aren't, don't have enough people looking. And same with these other birds. We know even less about that. I suspect a lot of those, you know, Boreal chickadees are disappearing from a lot of parts of Maine, and I, you know, I think the Down East Coast is one of them as well. Um, and Bicknell's thrush, yeah, probably the same thing. I think they used to be out on uh, some of these islands, but I haven't heard of any in quite a long time. And I think to the second part of that question, it would be definitely interesting to connect it to some of the. I forget exactly what was in the question, but sort of um, mountaintop data, you know, seeing if, um, especially if it's a long-term data set, could be really interesting to, you know, see how distributions are shifting or species are going in and out of that data set. So would be interested in connecting on that. Yeah, 
Great. Um, uh, Nancy also commented, let's talk about TNC islands. We have a few. Is that the Nature Conservancy? Is that what TNC, the acronym is? Yeah. 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 Oh, that's hi, Nancy. Sounds yeah, wonderful. hi. Um, so I work for Nature Conservancy in Maine. Elliot, I think you and I have talked, and um, yeah. I'm sure that we would be delighted. We have a few islands. I I honestly don't know where they all are, but um, I'm sure we'd be delighted to host some ARUs. Uh, so I can, I'll can i put my email in the chat to both of you, Elliot and Glenn, and we can uh, I can direct you to the right person, but I'm sure we'd be delighted to help. And um, the VCE Mountain Bird Watch data set, it's at least 10 years because I've been doing it for that long. It's a community science project. Um, so Jason Hill um, over at VCE, I'm sure would absolutely love to share data with you. Um, and yeah, it's across, it's not just Maine. Um, so I don't, might or not, might not be helpful, but interesting connection anyway. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, I'll reach out. Sounds good. Yeah, thanks for your talk. It was great. Thanks. All right. Well, that's all we have for questions in the chat at the moment. So unless anyone has anything else they want to jump in with, um, I think we're all done. Yeah, time to wrap up. And thanks so much, Elliot. It's Great research that you're getting involved in. Awesome. Thanks everybody for joining. Appreciate it. Thanks everyone.